it's good to see you to our 46th web debate. Today, we're looking at the topic, um, unpacking the EU's digital foreign policy. As you know, we organize these web debates once a month in the context of the International Forum on Diplomatic Training. My name is Katharina Höhner. I'm a researcher at Diplo Foundation, and I have the pleasure to moderate this debate. And we have quite a lot of things to discuss because clearly digital foreign policy is not only something done by states, but I would venture also something done by international organizations. And today we're going to look at the case of the European Union, the what, the who, the when, and the where, perhaps. Before I introduce our excellent speakers for today, let me mention that we want to make this debate as interactive as possible, which means we're looking for your questions and comments. You can post them in the chat here on Zoom, or if you're following us on Facebook or YouTube, you can use the chat there. My colleague, Dr. Stephanie borg seider will take a very close look at the comments and questions that are coming in, and we'll bring them back into the debate and pose uh, the key questions back to our speakers who can then answer those questions um, for you. But as I said, we have two formidable speakers on the topic. So allow me to very, very quickly um, introduce them. Of course, I will not do them justice, but uh, very briefly, we have Dr. Patrick Pavlak, who is the Brussels Executive Officer of the European Institute for Security Studies. And then we have Dr. Matthias Kettemann, who is a senior researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, the Hans Bredo Institute. Welcome, Patrick. Um, welcome, Matthias. It's a, a great pleasure to have you. Since we only have 45 minutes for this debate, I think it's time to just uh, jump in. So I have a very quick uh, lightning round question for uh, both Matthias and Patrick, which is the following. When you hear the term the EU's digital foreign policy, what are the three immediate associations um, that you have. Patrick, perhaps you can start us off. Sure. Hi, Katharina. Thank you for having us and hello everyone on the call. So I assume you are not asking us to develop a bit on what we mean. So my three words would be probably aspiration, regulation, and partnerships. And I'm very happy to uh, jump on and explain a bit more what I mean on, by those later on during the call. Okay, thank you. I'm also interested then to hear what our audience thinks. So um, perhaps you can also use the chat to give us your three um, keywords. But Matthias, what would you answer? Well, my three keywords would be uh, necessary, uh, vague, uh, and also um, uh, transcending uh, disciplinary boundaries and political uh, silos. Hey, I guess there's a lot to unpack. Uh, I, I really like those keywords because they, they give us an impression of, of where you're coming from, but they also leave lots of room for debate. So uh, this, this is uh, great. But let's dive uh, straight in perhaps. Um, uh, Patrick, I know that you focus on um, cyber issues in your work um, and especially cybersecurity, but zooming out for a moment, how would you define or explain the digital foreign policy of the European Union. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Again, this is a sort of a, a million dollar question and probably a lot of books we can uh, write about it, or maybe not. Uh, I think the bottom line answer for me would be that whether we talk about cyber diplomacy, as you have uh, phrased it as something that I deal with on a daily basis, or whether we call it digital diplomacy, the really bottom line is that we have to keep in mind, we talk about diplomacy as such. And I think we tend to come up with those different prefixes when we talk about diplomacy, uh, which then pushes us in the direction of reinventing the mechanisms and instruments and the whole of uh, whole sets of discourses and narratives about diplomacy, uh, which for me very often are really unnecessary. And I think something to keep in mind is whether we talk digital, cyber, tech, we actually talk about diplomacy most of the time. Uh, and we really have to bring it back to, um, uh, to what it's really about. The reason why it's so important is also because later it actually helps us to uh, navigate the field uh, that we know much better that something that maybe can seem to many as super technical, something that they really have no understanding of. And I think that's, um, that would be the first point. Now, 
When you ask about how can we explain uh, the EU's digital diplomacy, that really got me thinking immediately about, you know, this um, uh, very famous question about who do you call in the EU when you want to talk about foreign policy. I think if, we, if you ask me who do you call when you want to talk about EU's digital foreign policy, uh, I would have the same question because those of you who are familiar with the EU system know very well that we have a uh, high representative, uh, vice president of the commission dealing with foreign policy, but we also have two commissioners dealing with digital portfolio, right? And then digital is also part of the international cooperation. So if you really try to map the whole universe of the actors on the EU side dealing with digital aspects of foreign policy, uh, that would be quite a challenging task, uh, I would argue. Uh, so, so the, the one of the key challenges that really stems from that is very often this disconnect that we have between foreign policy on one hand and the digital agenda. With all those different actors occupying the space, uh, of course, uh, those familiar with the institutional landscapes and turf wars within the institutions, not only within the EU, but more broadly will recognize the pattern that, of course, the institutions like to expand on their territory and um, uh, occupy the bigger field, focusing on their own respective agendas. So this disconnect between um, the policies, uh, objectives, and the lack of communication sometimes is quite uh, present. And I think this might be uh, partly linked to what Matthias called this vagueness of the policy uh, and, the, and the fact that uh, it's difficult to connect those, do those dots. So if we really talk about the digital policy uh, in the EU, I don't know whether we can talk about foreign policy as such or whether actually something that we got more used to observe is the external dimension of the EU's uh, digital policies. And that's of course the domain of the European Commission that's uh, frequently pursued um, quite independently from uh, what the European External Action Service does, for instance. And that is linked, uh, let's say, to the uh, GDPR, NIS directive, and many other regulations or proposals of regulation that are originating uh, from the European Commission. Now, part of the discussion, of course, is taking place as well at the UN uh, and the high level panel on digital cooperation is a very good example of that. There again, this overlap between the competences of the European Commission and the External Action Service um, are, are quite clear. So I think uh, the reason why I'm not giving you a very clear answer what the digital foreign policy is in the EU is because I I don't really think we have the definition of uh, what that is. And maybe exactly this lack of uh, unifying doctrine that would sort of pull all those different st uh, strands under one umbrella is one of the biggest problems and, and the weaknesses. Now, in one of the pieces that I wrote last year, what I've suggested is that maybe the idea of digilateralism could be a sort of a, a unifying narrative, right? Where you could try to bring digital, cyber, and tech issues as part of the EU's um, uh, foreign policy agenda. But most importantly, going back to my initial message, you know, whether you want to call it uh, digital diplomacy, cyber diplomacy, whether it's part of the foreign policy, the most important challenge there is the fact that we need the diplomatic corps that is fluent in the, in the digital tech and cyber vocabulary, which I think for the moment is uh, very often missing, uh, which then of course explains why the most recently proposed EU cybersecurity strategy also calls for the establishment, for instance, of the EU cyber diplomacy network in the EU delegations. The European Commission already has uh, the network of digital attaches spread around the, around the world. So uh, to some extent, what is really needed is on one hand, this narrative that would unify those different ele institutional elements, but at the same time, uh, this, let's say, this sort of awareness raising exercise within the institutions that will help uh, pull it all together. And maybe then I think we would achieve what could be called or resemble digital foreign policy, which I would argue for the moment is uh, probably missing. We have some ideas, we have some objectives, but I would not necessarily call it the cohesive um, uh, foreign po digital foreign policy as such. Thank you. I think also just on, on terminology, that was a very good reminder that uh, 
no matter what terms we're using in the end, we're talking about diplomacy. But uh, uh, Pat uh, Patrick, I also found it really interesting that you kind of said it's a very complex picture and you're not quite sure if I understood you correctly, if we can talk about a digital foreign policy of the European Union. Um, that brings me um, to Matthias. Uh, and Matthias, I have, a, I have a, based on, on what we just heard, I have a perhaps um, very uh, challenging uh, question for you. So let's assume there is something resembling a digital foreign policy of the European Union for a second. Um, would, why would we need one? And if the EU um, didn't have one, why would the EU need a digital foreign policy? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the possibility for me to talk a bit about this extremely exciting and very timely uh, topic. Yes, the European Union absolutely needs a digital uh, foreign policy. Why? Well, how do we, uh, under the conditions of digitality, exercise power as Europe? We are not going to reinvent a European Facebook or a European Google. We are not going to suddenly discover oil. The uh, potential that Europe has in shaping the future, in developing the rules and norms under which uh, the digital future can be turned sustainable and the sustainability can be turned uh, digital are ones which we can project only if we have a successful dig digital foreign policy. And this has two dimensions. First of all, I think we should always understand digital foreign policy to mean uh, traditional foreign policy using digital tools. Using Twitter is part of digital foreign policy one dimension of it. But it also, of course, means um, exercising uh, foreign policy influence regarding uh, digital issues, digital topics, uh, ensuring, for instance, uh, hardware uh, security, ensuring that the norms that Europe provides, basically Europe's uh, normative software, are respected globally. This is all part of how Europe can successfully promote its interests. And it's therefore not a coincidence that um, uh, a, a, a well understood nuanced approach to um, cybersecurity, for instance, uh, asks for more interaction between Europe's rules on data, its rules on markets, on internet services and algorithms, and its approach to uh, security to cybersecurity, and all of that, you know, this big normative push that Europe has in the next uh, in the next year, this has to be translated and uh, shown to the world. We can only do that in a uh, in a successful digital uh, foreign policy um, endeavor. We have to realize that power is exercised in cyberspace, and we have to use the digital tools that Europe has to project this power this clever, smart, normative power which uh, Europe can, um, can exercise. Uh, I also acknowledge, I'll be the first to acknowledge that what we currently have still falls short of a coherent cyber uh, diplomacy, as, as Patrick also um, uh, well, well uh, discussed. Um, but this shouldn't, uh, shouldn't dishearten us, rather it should show us the way uh, to make things better. Yes, there is a certain uh, unstrategic uh, uh, orientation. We need to make that better. We, met, we have to focus on a clear strategy to ensure a more cohesive digital foreign policy. Thank, uh, thank you so much. Um, maybe, uh, maybe a very quick follow-up question. Can you give us a, a hint on how, how this uh, greater cohesion could be, or should be, in your opinion, developed? Just, just a, a small hint, perhaps. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I love, for instance, uh, uh, the, the this idea of um, having uh, of having closer cooperation through digital uh, sort of ambassadors and through digital attaches. I think that's an extremely important approach. Uh, just the the different cyber ambassadors we have right now in the foreign ministries already together provide such an important discourse sphere that. Um, that has a, a, a strong um, has, has, has has strong internal dimensions within the different countries. You have to go through the people. Mm. Yeah. Th thank you, Patrick. You want to come in on, on that point exactly? Please. 
Yes, just just quickly to add something that just came to my mind. You know, when um, the issue of uh, foreign policy more broadly came up on the agenda, you know, establishing Foreign Affairs Council as this mechanism to bring member states around the table and discuss issues was uh, was a quite a straightforward solution. You know, if we really want to go in the institutional dimension, why not to have Digital Affairs Council where actually you could have uh, people discuss different issues falling under that topic. I mean, again, I think part of the problem is that everybody talks about digital issues as becoming part of a foreign policy agenda and being an important aspect of it. But we hardly see really uh, that being followed through with the concrete actions. We you know, do not have investment in the resources. It's great that we have digital ambassadors in some countries, uh, digital attaches being the posted in the EU delegations, but that still cannot really substitute the policy as such. And I think this is one of the biggest um, biggest challenges we have. How do we pull it all together? You know, how we move from talking and acknowledging to really putting on the table something that uh, will really translate into concrete policies and uh, and actions afterwards. Something that is less reactive, but some but more uh, European at the core. You know what Matthias was describing: those more value based or normative undertaking. You know that EU calls very often the human centric approach to digital, right? Which I would I I, I read as a sort of a synonym for for normative undertaking that the EU wants to take in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, following up on that, from, from what Matthias just said, I also uh, was very much reminded of, for example, the General Data Protection Regulation uh, as a normative guidepost that kind of, uh, there's a sort of norm entrepreneur that the idea is that the EU agrees on a regulation or sets norms that then um, are kind of also adopted or at least serve as um, a guidepost or as a suggestion in other regions, other countries. So that I think is also an, a, a, basically a dimension of what we might call uh, European digital foreign policy. Um, but perhaps, uh, Patrick, because you just mentioned um, digital policy of the EU, and I think in, in your initial statement, you also said that uh, perhaps uh, we're not yet there to talk about the digital foreign policy, but foreign policy elements of the EU's digital strategy. So there's something I very specifically want to come back on. So last year, um, the Commission President, also von der Leyen, kind of uh, announced the digital decade for Europe. And I know you wrote a paper where you, in detail, kind of analyzed uh, guideposts for this digital decade. So sticking with that, uh, can, you, can you explain a bit more what, what your guideposts are and perhaps also in relation to digital foreign policy or diplomacy? Sure, I was uh, completely unsuccessful in trying to set the agenda because the orientation points that the commission has taken have nothing to do with the four that I proposed. But uh, so, so that's, that's the uh, policy advice uh, failure, uh, if, I can, uh, if I can sum it up that way. But um, actually following those discussions last year, we already had on 9 March this year, uh, the concrete proposal put on the table um, where the digital compass uh, towards 2030 has been also further elaborated. Uh, so I encourage those of you on the uh, on the call to have a look at it if you haven't done so. But uh, back then, indeed, um, for, for issues that I put as a sort of orientation points um, for the EU's digital compass, uh, were sovereignty, resilience, uh, norms, and multilateralism. And let me quickly explain uh, why those why those four. I mean, indeed, digital sovereignty is a topic that has popped up on the European agenda and is developed uh, um, much more in detail over the past uh, months. And we're definitely going to see this discussion unfolding in the coming months, if not years. But we have to keep in mind that, of course, uh, you know, this is not, um, Europe doesn't operate in isolation and that other actors, of course, are observing very carefully what happens in the EU and very often try to actually replicate the similar narrative and discourse when we talk about um, sovereignty issues. So I think one of the... Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, with regards to sovereignty would be really for the EU to um, make choices that strengthen European technologies and alternatives. 
Um, but also the EU increasingly will also have to uh, fend off attacks on its own policies. So as we aspire to be more digitally sovereign, uh, and we can discuss later whether anything like that exists in today's world, it will also have to engage in a much more uh, mature, let's call it this way, foreign policy that explains what the EU's approach is about and tries to uh, maybe get more and more allies on its sides. The second issue I, I put on the table was the idea of resilience, uh, simply because as the EU becomes much more active actor internationally, whether in the digital domain on foreign policy more broadly, it will see... Uh, it, um, let's say, increased interest in its own policies, which then will lead to more, uh, which might, will make it more uh, attractive target for cyber espionage or politically motivated cyber attacks. So the resilience was a sort of um, uh, another element that I uh, thought would be extremely important to look at. Norms uh, links to some of those initial ideas that I said, you know, how what do we fill in the digital foreign policy with? What, what can the content of it be? And for me here, the, the sort of um, norms that are inherent in the EU's regulation could exactly provide the content for its digital foreign policy. So uh, this idea of human-centric, you know, uh, rule of law, uh, human rights compliant, and so on and so forth, could become something that becomes um, the content of its foreign policy. And finally, multilateralism, because I think that's a sort of uh, the other side of a sovereign discussion. Uh, it's quite interesting that uh, as the EU talks uh, about sovereignty and tries to promote the language of multilateral cooperation, we also see more and more countries who are actually pushing for multilateral, multilateral solutions when it comes to digital and cyber issues. And I think that is going to pose quite an important policy dilemma for the EU, and it will push it to be much more nuanced in its understanding of multilateral cooperation. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the issue of data protection, you know, we have a new Chinese initiative that, fo that focuses on data security initiative, which actually very much calls and pushes uh, for multilateral solutions. Now, uh, I think that will be quite an interesting uh, discussion that will be unfolding because of course, if the EU wants to stand behind multilateralism, it will have to engage in those discussions within the UN or other fora. But at the same time, that would put certain constraints on what it can do as this digitally sovereign actor. And I think that's one of the dilemmas that um, we have maybe not fully confronted yet on the, uh, on the European side. So I think these four issues will be something that the EU will have to increasingly confront and try to balance uh, in its policies, foreign, but also domestic. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting emphasis on, on multilateralism and perhaps uh, when we speak about tech issues and digital issues, perhaps also um, multi-stakeholderism, um, I, uh, I would add. But also this question of, um, well, sovereignty, digital sovereignty. And that's definitely something I would like to come back to because it's a it's a very important issue, but also the question, does it even exist? But we will come back to that later, hopefully, if, um, if there is time. I uh, would also like to dive a bit into a paper that uh, Matthias has written, I think, um, just, uh, just a couple of weeks, uh, weeks ago, um, and which focuses on uh, EU um, cyber diplomacy. And in that paper, you argued it needs to be a more coherent. And I think this argument for a more coherent approach is something that echoes uh, with uh, everything you've said so far in, in this debate. But can you perhaps um, explain what you mean by cyber diplomacy specifically and, and what your suggestions are? Absolutely. So uh, you're referring to a, a, a paper that I've co-authored with Annegret Bendig of the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik uh, in Berlin. And we looked at the uh, recent cybersecurity strategy and tried to find out what it contained uh, for uh, cyber diplomacy and whether, as we found, it couldn't be improved uh, a little bit with regard to a more you know, coherent formulation of cyber diplomacy. So we called for a, an update of the cyber diplomacy dimension. Cyber diplomacy is what I've mentioned before, you know, for cyber foreign policy in both of its dimensions, the use of tools to 
uh, the use of digital tools uh, to exercise foreign policy uh, influence and also the um, uh, exercise of influence regarding uh, foreign policy uh, um, goals on, on the internet and with regard to digitality. We have, um, we have called for, for a number of improvements, which can be can implemented pretty easily. So first of all, um, we are convinced, uh, Ms. Bendik and I, that um, we can uh, harness the tools of cyber diplomacy to uh, increase the self-determination of people, of Europeans over their personal data. This dimension of, uh, we'll talk about that perhaps later, but uh, uh, if, if the oh, difficult concept of digital sovereignty has any use, um, it, is, it must also be used to increase the uh, uh, ownership of individuals over their, their, their data and also their sense of digital development, you know. We should not leave people behind. People have to understand that they are part of a process of digitalization and we have to make sure that all attempts by Europe to uh, exercise uh, uh, its, its cyber diplomatic um, uh, powers has to be based on the premised upon the goal of ensuring informational self-determination of uh, European citizens over their personal data. We see good examples going in that direction. You know, protection of, of data is one of Europe's more, more stronger, uh, stronger normative experts. You know, think of the GDA, uh, the the General Data Protection Regulation, and think about its uh, impact it had on jurisdictions from California to to South America to to, to Asia. Think about the impact that judgments uh, such as Schrems one and two had. So we are here on a pretty pretty firm 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 footing as, when it comes to exporting certain normative um, uh, priorities. The second part is we have to link the um, the strategic capacity of Europe to act in the foreign policy field to the goals it has to. Uh, it, it wants to wants to reach. So we have to make clear how do the strategic capacities and the and Europe's uh, digital diplomacy goals uh, relate to each other. And we see currently a certain vagueness or ambiguity uh, between the the goals and their strategic uh, possibilities. Um, we also call for a re-sovereignization of certain parts of uh, of, of the the digital uh, landscape. Resovereignization does not have to be uh, uh, be negative. We see this rather as an important um, uh, as, as ensuring a certain minimum level of control over certain necessary technological resources, from uh, internet nodes to cloud infrastructure to international standard setting, which allow Europe to continue to set the rules or at least influence the rules that its citizens have to follow in the coming years and decades. We should not underestimate the power of standard setting, you know, and this is a process which we have to be involved in as uh, if we want to uh, project European uh, normative uh, power um, on, the, uh, on the internet. And as the, as the last point, uh, we call for, um, we call for a, a more coherent approach that uh, uh, takes up the important uh, normative um, projects currently running on platforms, on algorithms, uh, on data. You know the the big uh, the big new proposals, and they have to be integrated into the overall framework of Europe's power exercise online. Mm. Very, very interesting. So um, if, if I remember correctly, Patrick put, put a question mark on, on digital sovereignty, whether or not such a thing exists. And you started by bringing it down to the individual level, but also an, encouraged a, a re-sovereignization, which is very interesting. And that actually caused quite quite a bit of a debate uh, in the chat. Uh, I just saw this from, from the corner of my eye, so to speak, that for example, one comment was that Europe should stay away from the loaded notion of um, digital sovereignty. Which basically brings me to my colleague um, Stephanie, who has kept a keen eye on what has been happening in the chat. And from what I saw, there was a lot happening. So can you try to give us a summary, Stephanie? Sure. Uh, thank you, Katharina. Yes, indeed. Very vibrant uh, discussion in the chat here, as you can see in Zoom. And also questions coming in from uh, Facebook by uh, the audience who is following us uh, there. So hello to them also. Uh, 
I have grouped the questions into four parts, uh, four teams, um, and for each of the teams, there are various questions. So hopefully these teams will make it easier uh, for our special guests to answer them. I'll start with part one, which I will call a sort of a back to basics. So the questions related to this uh, back to basics part is um, um, whether uh, you think that uh, um, there is a lack of um, terminological clarity and whether that will fragment the international discourse. So uh, um, a lack of clarity uh, when we refer to the jargon related to the um, uh, digital foreign policy. And the related question is, uh, what do you think uh, the diplomats can bring to the table more than the other groups, uh, more than the technical uh, community, etc. So what is the key role there uh, of the, for the diplomats? So that's part one. Uh, part two is, um, in my view, related to the tech sovereignty question, which you have tackled uh, quite uh, in depth. And here there is a key question related to that. So why doesn't the EU speak more about uh, uh, cooperation to find win-win solutions? So it is related to the language. So part two is a language question. Part three is regarding the cooperation that the EU has with other actors, other players. Um, part of that is its relation. It is the current um, uh, cooperation between the EU and NATO and how that impacts the digital foreign policy. So maybe we have a few rec uh, reflections on that. Um, and related to it, again, uh, EU's position, um, how can it position itself as a key uh, actor in between US and China and Russia. Part four uh, relates to the tech actors. So the way uh, that the tech actors in the US have grown and grown, you know, the situation with the big tech at the moment, um, and we contrast that with the growth or existence or lack of uh, tech companies which are as big as the US. So we're uh, in the chat, we're debating why there aren't um, uh, companies as large as there is in uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, some of us are um, uh, discussing the, the possibility that antitrust laws could be one uh, aspect, uh, also a question uh, uh, related to um, data, the fact that um, the EU is trying to, uh, through the GDPR and similar rules, uh, to rebalance the landscape again. Um, uh, and uh, oh, more questions coming in. So I'll stop there even with the part four. And um, probably, Katarina, I'll ask you to give me the floor back because this conversation on the last part, tech actors, I'm sure it will, um, it will further uh, evolve. So back to you. Thank, thanks for the summary, Steph. Um, that was uh, great and also s touching on so many um, different um, issues. So thanks to our audience um, for the questions and comments. Please keep them coming and I will make sure to give the floor back to Stephanie to reflect on any comments and questions that are coming in now. But basically over to you, Matthias and Patrick, for some reflections on some of the questions. Obviously, please feel free to pick and choose from these um, for themes that um, Steph outlined. Um, let's start with Patrick, if I may. Can you give us some thoughts and reflections on what we just heard? Sure, so thank you all for uh, this very rich uh, questions and Stephanie for uh, grouping them for us. That's that's uh, very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll start with this back to basic question and the lack of uh, terminological clarity. I mean, I think I would absolutely agree. I will admit openly that uh, you know, when I got the invitation to this discussion, I actually had to start checking what digital foreign policy was, uh, because uh, the understanding of the terminology I've all usually worked with would be, you know, the use of social media for foreign policy, right? That's a sort of a conventional uh, reference that I was used to. And then I uh, started unpacking it. And indeed, you know, when we talk about digital foreign policy, we talk foreign policy on and about the digital policy issues, right? So that is a, a slightly different understanding. But again, you know, we, we operate with different uh, language there. And 
for many years, cyber terminology was very, and still remains very complex. If you start adding to it the digital vocabulary, the, the landscape becomes much more uh, complicated. And people have very different uh, understanding. If you talk about human-centric technology, let's say, as the EU is discussing it, uh, we could probably find very different understanding of what human-centric means for European, even for Europeans and between the member states, and what it might mean for a country outside of Europe. So I would absolutely agree uh, that we need some uh, more understanding of what that, um, let's say, uh, linguistic uh, innovation uh, means for, for our discussions. But a very interesting question that was asked is what do diplomats bring to the table? And one of my favorite anecdotes, having watched, you know, what's happening within the council in the cyber discussions over the past uh, six, seven years is a, a quite a significant shift in the conversation uh, with an increase of uh, career diplomats around the tables. And when I say career diplomats, I mean diplomats who have stepped into the conversation about cyber and digital not from the security perspective, so with their earlier NATO background, let's say, but who came to the conversation uh, having been posted in New York for five years, having served in uh, uh, countries in the global south, you name it. Their perspective on those conversations is completely different, and it's quite interesting because they really have um, this extremely uh, useful uh, sensi uh, sensibility towards, uh, you know, thinking about the digital and tech as a foreign policy issue. So it has been a real pleasure to, to watch. Uh, and so really in answering the question, what do diplomats bring to the table? I would say this freshness of perspective that people who have always looked at cyber and digital for the security prism have maybe lost. And especially when we talk about foreign policy, uh, and cyber and digital in the context of the UN, for instance, this is a sort of expertise around the table uh, that we will need. Um, Matthias, I'll let you jump in maybe on some of the points that you want to pick up. And then if we have time, I'll, uh, I'll go back to some of the other questions that we'll ask. Absolutely, with much, much pleasure. So I, um, I think we have to be aware that European diplomats who have a lot of experience in navigating, you know, uh, 15 plus and more uh, national positions are very well placed to uh, engage uh, international uh, actors in finding uh, good solutions for cyber issues. Um, I've had great experiences with European diplomats in international uh, multi-stakeholder discussions on uh, internet governance topics. So I think this is really a, a, a place where we can harness the experience of the European diplomatic uh, core. Um, I, when I look at the, the German foreign ministry, I see a, a huge development over the last years towards uh, digital foreign policy with the installment of a cyber, uh, cyber diplomacy chief um, with uh, attaches working specifically on cyber topics. And I think this should be even to a stronger degree replicated on the, within the European um, foreign policy uh, landscape. We have such such, such important uh, individuals uh, contributing to internet governance discussions, for instance, within national foreign ministries. Um, I know I know Switzerland is not part of the EU, but uh, Jorge Cantia, who I see in the in the um, uh, comments here, uh, knows more about internet governance than the, the most of us. You know, so we we, we have here really important um, individual contributions which need to be. Uh, harnessed towards uh, common European uh, goals. And one of those goals is finding those win-win solutions. So when I talk about projecting power, uh, I don't mean that in a, you know, in a uh, Kissingerian way, but rather in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. You know, projecting power means also projecting normative values, ensuring that the intricate processes of digitalization in the coming years are based not on on the priorities of other states, but rather on the priorities that uh, that European Union stakeholders choose. And those should be uh, the ones expressed, for instance, in the uh, Fundamental Rights Charter, um, which I think is a better base than uh, national uh, uh, priorities of, of other states uh, as, a, as a guiding light to inform the way that we exercise uh, digital foreign policy. One word on the vocabulary. 
I don't think the vocabulary is complex. I think there are some people who want to make it complex because they don't want to allow other people into the realm of, of discussions, right? I mean, it's like, like talking to doctors. They can either say, well, your, your, your thorax is unremarkable, but nobody knows what they mean. They could also say, you know, you don't have any problems breathing. So it's really more about um, uh, opening up the field, right? We should reduce complexity. We should show that digitalization is nothing spectacularly difficult. It's just another... Uh, another uh, dimension of exercising power. You don't have to program stuff yourself, right? You just have to engage in the same policy questions, power, rights, justice, but now uh, regarding the, the regarding digital tools and digital digital goods. Thank you. That also reminds me of, of, of this question. Perhaps we should uh, talk about foreign policy. And at some point, digital has become so mainstream that we don't need to emphasize digital foreign policy. But uh, there are some things that still have been happening uh, in the chat here in Zoom, as well as on YouTube and Facebook. So perhaps, Stephanie, you can bring in a couple more questions and comments for our final reflections. Thanks, Kat. I would say it's more of the same. Um, and it's uh, essentially the so the question that the issue, the, the, the part uh, which has been evolving in the chat regar is regarding the big tech. So again, the landscape uh, in which the big tech operate in the US versus in the EU. So the policies, the laissez-faire approach that was uh, in um, uh, typical in the US, um, but not in Europe, uh, and the fact that in the US, things are changing. So more and more, even with, with, with uh, antitrust, with the efforts to rein in the power of the big tech, things are shifting. And somehow the US and the EU are more, um, are converging a little bit there. Uh, so no new questions, uh, more on the same. Um, and if there is time uh, to reflect maybe on this issue and on the previous uh, part, part three on the relations between uh, the EU, NATO and China and Russia, um, if there is time, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're almost, so to speak, running out of time. So I would basically give the floor once more to both of our speakers to, for a final word of reflection, to incorporate some of the questions and comments again, or perhaps to uh, give us their, um, their final reflection or a key point that they would like us um, to take away from this debate. Um, so let's start perhaps with Matthias and then Patrick. And again, thanks for your comments and questions. Um, it's really appreciated. Uh, lively debate in the chat. Um, it's really great to see. So uh, Matthias. Mm -hmm. Upon the danger that you've heard this, this point made in other settings before, but um, Europe really has the possibility to pursue a, a third way of uh, digital, um, digital governance, right? We don't have to, Vladimir has made that point in the, the chat also, we have the luxury that we don't have such strong companies that have a major influence on uh, Europe's uh, foreign policy, right? Or its internal policy. Um, we have the luxury to that we do not have a strong, strong uh, state uh, like, like China or, or Russia that dictates how foreign policy uh, has to be made in the digital realm. Um, we can really uh, in an, uh, go back to, to the values expressed in the judgments, uh, in, the doc in the documents, in the strategic priorities and uh, build on them to create a better, uh, a better foreign policy, a better digitalization especially in post-pandemic times. The internet is not going to go away. Uh, the importance of communicative spaces is not going to go away. But rather, we have to ensure, as Europe, for instance, that the uh, inordinate power of private public spaces is compensated by a sort of a republicization of the internet. And you can only do that if you have a strong, uh, a strong um, stakeholder behind you, such as the European Union. I don't think that we will expect great uh, innovative um, regulation regarding the future of the internet to come from the US or from China or from Russia. It's really down to Europe to set the rules for sustainable digitalization and for digital sustainability. And that's why this topic, this debate is so essential for, for the future of us, for the future of mankind, you know. 
this is really one of the key things we have to grapple with. Patrick, your um, final words. Yes, Matthias has opened so many brackets right now that uh, I'm going to leave this discussion very unsatisfied. But um, uh, let me maybe finish with, uh, with uh, one thing. I agree partly with Matthias that uh, the Europe, what it has, it's the sort of a normative agenda that it can push for the digital policies. My main concern is that there are not many clients for what the EU is selling. And the main dilemma for the EU's foreign digital policy is how do you actually make sure that uh, what we're trying to put on the table is something that uh, others want. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, win-win situations, I think one of the main challenges there is that wins are defined differently by different countries. And I think the whole discussion around 5G is a very uh, good example of that, right? When Europeans uh, go to many countries and try to explain to them why investing in secure 5G technology is so important. The answer they hear most of the time is, well, you know, it's great. We'll think about it in 10, 15 years. What we need for the moment is cheap technology so that our economies and societies can move forward. Uh, so, you know, this whole norma normative uh, embellishment that we also want to sell is not necessarily something that uh, others see as an immediate concern. And I think the biggest challenge is exactly to uh, convince the others that what is our win is in long term also working to their benefits. But we have not actually done that. And uh, unfortunately, too often, you know, the language uh, in the conversation that permutates is focused on the norms and values rather than concrete economic and developmental benefits. And that's something that um, uh, that makes this third way between US, China that others were pushing for really very difficult to, uh, to materialize and, and sell uh, on the international stage. And I'll stop there, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, this discussion has definitely uh, left us hungry for more, echo echoing what Patrick just said. Also in, in these last statements, I, I heard some, some disagreement between the two of you. That's also uh, something worth unpacking perhaps. Um, as always, we will follow up with a summary of the debate, a written summary. Uh, we will also reflect on all the comments and questions um, that we received. And then from there, we can perhaps take the conversation further. But what I also noticed that there's a lot of room for discussion on the topic of digital sovereignty. And I think that's something we will pick up uh, on in one of our uh, next debates. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, here on Zoom, on YouTube and on Facebook. And most importantly, thank you to our speakers who provided us with lots of food for thought and a discussion that was extremely rich and that I'm sure will continue even after this debate. So thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Patrick.